so honored, actually, um, that Carlos has asked me to introduce uh, Tessa. Um, I met her actually here uh, when she was talking about her book, and I just feel um, that I'm at an age at this point, I won't say what age, but that to see younger folks coming up and preserving our culture and, and, and being in academia to me is so important. Mm -hmm. And to see her and, and a few other capabilities <coughs> women to be in these roles is so, so important for our community. So it's my honor to introduce you to Dr. Tessa Silva Lima Neves, who is a proud black African woman, wife, mom, scholar, award-winning <coughs> professor, and community leader. <coughs> She was born and raised in Cabo Verde, West Africa, and as a teenager, she emigrated to the United States with her parents and sisters. As a scholar and expert, which I can't believe this, but with 20 years, because she's a look <laughs> with 20 years of experience in global education, critical teaching pedagogies, black African transnational feminisms, right up my alley, access equity and inclusion, Dr. Lima Neves has delivered keynote lectures and presentations and facilitated workshops <coughs> for, for Charlotte Teachers Institute, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Howard University, go Howard, my daughter's alma mater, <laughs> <laughs> Providence College, Brown University, <coughs> the National Humanities <coughs> Center, University of New York at Buffalo, Vanguard, Vanguard Corporation, among <coughs> other places. Dr. Lima Neves is a graduate of Provident College and Clark Atlanta, Clark Atlanta University. I'm going to say Dr. Lima Neves because I really believe that it's such an accomplishment that I'm not even going to use your first name. Dr. Lima Neves is a professor of political science and the chair of the Department of Social Sciences and Interdisciplinary <coughs> Studies at Johnson C. Smith University. She's the principal editor of the book. Cabo Verde, Cabo Verde Woman, Writing Remembrance, Resilience and Revolution, Criolas Pedagosas. And if you haven't gotten the book, please do, because in the book, there's featured women from our community, including, I just saw Eva Brito, that mm -hmm. yes. just walked in, yes. as well as Candida. Yes. Um, so please, please, uh, please support that. Uh, it's a wonderful book. As an educator and scholar, her research is interdisciplinary in nature and straddles the field of political science, sociology, African studies, and women and gender studies. Teresa is the co-founder of Puerto Rosa International Conference of Cape Verdean Women, which is coming up on Saturday, and founding president of Cape Verdeans of the Carolinas Association. She holds a certificate of Leadership Foundation training at the Harvard Business School for, for Executive Leadership through the International Women's Forum, a global fellowship program for distinguished women leaders from over 25 countries. She is one of, 20, she's one of the 2022 20, Charlotte Ledger 40 over 40 leaders. That's where your age comes in? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't say that. Not not <laughs> Teresa is also the 2020 Martin Luther King Jr. Vision Award for Social Justice recipient at Providence College. She was the 2019 finalist for the HBCU Digest Female Faculty of the Year and the 2019 to 2020 president of the National Carolina Political Science Association. The first black president person to serve in this role. She lives in Charlotte with her husband, Louis, and their children. And without further ado, mm -hmm. I'm so honored to present to you <laughs> Dr. Tessa I will be 47 on May 26th. Oh, no. Any Gemini's in the house? Okay, Gemini's, yes, yes. 
Shout out to my home girl, um, Diva Brito, co-author. Um, any other co-authors in the house? All right. I'm sure a bunch of them, uh, well, Eve's going to be presenting at Poderaza on Saturday, so come by if you want to hear her tell you all things poetry and how to tell your stories. So anyhow, uh, I can't thank you enough, Carlos, uh, Madam President, for um, inviting me here. Um, so many, like my cheeks, like they're like, I've <laughs> been like this the whole time. From the moment I walked in and I see my childhood neighbor, Zach. <laughs> Zach has known me even before I was born. Um, you know, just he live, they live right next door, um, uh, his parents, and I'm good friends with his sister, Cece. You know, we grew up together. So from the moment I walked in, I knew that I was home. Mm -hmm. I felt home because I saw you. So thank you for that first mm -hmm. feeling. Um, but I knew that I was home. I was going to be taken care of. Thank you. Obrigada por convidar para os outros estados. Os outros bem. Os outros de de frio, de chuva, mas os outros de limpo. Obrigada por os outros. Thank you so much. Appreciate y'all. Um, what else? No, thank you. Thank you, um, Institute for Cape Verdean Studies. Um, uh, my home girl, Dr. Kim Gallen, she's at Brown University for driving to move effort with me. Um, I appreciate it uh, from Providence. And um, so just so many familiar faces. So I feel really just happy to be here and um, feeling like I'm home. The homies that I met in Cape Verde. <laughs> yes, so we were in Barcelona in Cape Verde together. So we met there. And I think that that's why they're here, because they saw us. <laughs> but we were having a good time a uh, few weeks ago in Cape Verde. So thank you. And then everyone else. Um, and uh, students, I'm going to try to talk at a good pace for your poison's sake. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, this is, it's a community vibe, y'all. It's a conversation. So. I'm not going to sit here and talk at you. I'm, can I sit down? Is that sure. okay? Good. All right, great. Um, so thank you so much. And you're going to hear this weird accent. It's sort of like me at Cap Verde, but I lived in New England, but then I lived down south for the last 20 years. So it's like <laughs> this really weird southern twang, y'all, you know, so happy to, yeah. So that's the where the accent is coming from. Goodness. So. Um, all right, so Carlos was like, oh, you, you should do something on International Women's Month. I'm like, okay, so what should I talk about? And I just be thinking about, okay, so if I got in front of the community, what are some of the things that I really want to talk about? And not just with the Cape Verdean community, but with the larger communities of people who um, are around us, that love us, that study us, that uh, write about us, right, that are, um, in partnership with us, right, who are part of our organizations, who are married to us, right, mm -hmm. all of that, um, yeah. who take care of our children. What would I want to talk about, right? And so let me see if I get this thing right. Uh, hold up, what am I doing? Nope. David. Hey, David. David. Just, just click the mouse down. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. All right, here we go. Now we're business. For equity's sake, can, can you all hear me? Yes. Do I need to be speaking into this? Because I want to make sure it's inclusive, it's equitable. Do I need to be using the mic? Sumuza's microphone. Mamjur? Okay, Mamjur, Navarra. Can you see the difference? Does it make a difference? Okay, don't take all. Before I start, um, one of the things that I like to do before I start, um, as a black African woman, I'd like to ask for permission and thank the elders in the room for allowing me to speak as an expert on anything. But recognizing that my elders, actually, they're the ones who know it all. So if you're an elder in the room, do I have your permission to speak in front of you as an expert? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. That's all. Yes. And by elders, I mean the, you know, the, the Cape Verdean elders in the room because I always tell my grandmother that she's the smartest woman I know. So if she was here, I would be asking her for permission to speak. So how dare I be an expert on anything when she is you know, 90 years of wisdom how dare I speak as an expert in, in her presence, right? So thank you for your blessing to speak. Um, in the age of social media, so I always want to keep the conversation fresh and all of that. Uh, if you want to hit me up on social media, if you hear anything that I'm saying that makes sense to you and want to tweet it out, you know, I'm still going to say Twitter, even though the man with the, you know, the car guy, I refuse to say X. Um, Twitter, Instagram, feel free to tag me if I say anything or if something that resonates with you that I said, you might want to 
share that back with me. So feel free to connect with me. Or if you just want to be cool, you know, I talk a lot of junk on social media. So uh, feel free to connect with me there. So just so you know what I'm going to be talking about today, um, this is just basically the overview. One of the things that I wanted to sort of um, get us to begin to explore, so this is a sort of an exploratory conversation, right? Let's look at what are the ex existing narratives about our community, the Cape Verdean community that exists right now, right? What are the existing narratives? What are people saying about us? Right? And what are we saying about ourselves, more, most importantly? What messages are we saying about ourselves? And what do the messages, how do they perpetuate stereotypes or not? And then I want to focus on some realities. And these realities include the mess. Because, you know, we can be messy just like everybody else. Right? It, 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 it is what it is. You know, it's, it can be mess. And we'll get into the nitty gritty of that because uh, it's necessary. Then I want to talk to you about how complex we are, just like any other community of immigrant groups, any other diaspora group, we are very complex people, right? So this idea of Cape Verdeans being unique, um, yeah, we're cute and all, but is we're not <laughs> we're not that unique. But you know, we're special in our own way. But I want to talk about the complexities and what the, the, the amazing things that make us who we are, right? And then I want to then, uh, obviously, it's Women's International Women's Month, and you're like, okay, so we're talking about K-Virgins, but when are we going to talk about the women? And this is when we come in, where I want to talk to, I want us to talk about and think about how do we move the needle forward on what we research about, what we talk about in the community, um, the types of activities that we engage in. So I want us to think about how do we move the needle forward as we develop, continue to develop as a community. And then I'm always going to have a charge for us. So the normally in my classroom when I, um, I'm talking to my students, the question that I say is, so what? What does this all mean? Who cares? Like when you leave here, this door, what does this all mean? So we'll get into that. And then, of course, some time for Q&A, right? Um, that part, okay? So that's the part I like the most because we engage and I am hoping to learn from you. This is what feeds me when I get to be in the community. Living in Charlotte, North Carolina, I don't get to really be in community. And so um, I get really, really excited when I'm amongst the people, okay? so. Um, so before we begin the conversation, you have to know what I mean by certain things, right? Because I'm throwing away, I'm throwing all these words out here, transnationalism, gender, and all this stuff. OK, so this is not to say you don't know what these words mean. This is to say this is how I'm using these words today. Does that make sense? Yep. So you may know what transnationalism is. So you may know what the Cape Verdean diaspora or immigrant community means. And you may know what gender is, but I want, you, I, I, I want to make sure that I'm clear in the way that I'm employing them in this conversation. OK? Um, so with transnationalism, I'm talking about the flow of everything, whether it be people, ideas, goods, right? The way we're relating to, to one another in a transnational way. Okay, so that's what I mean by that. And I try to use personal pictures. So that's me in a group of uh, Johnson C. Smith students during a 2017 trip to Cabo Verde, when um, all shade, all petty, when Cabo Verde Airlines was operating. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> For my kid Verdes in the house, you know what that is. Because you see that plane behind us, right? You see we got on that plane, yes. Many people have not been getting on the plane since 2017. But anyways. Uh, the community, by the community, um, I'm specifically talking about the Cape Verdean community in the US, OK? So for the sake of this conversation, I'm not talking about the Cape Verdean diaspora in Holland, in Portugal. I'm talking about us right here, right now in this room, OK? And from all the different places, right? And then gender, um, as a black transnational feminist, I use the word gender in a very expansive way. Right, so anyone as a human who sees themselves 
as especially when I'm talking about women who, who identifies themselves as, as, as a woman, as femme, so that's who I'm talking about. And in that picture, very intentionally, that's me at a hotel in Cap Verde meeting with my very long time friends. Um, those are members of the queer community in Cap Verde. You see Chinda in the background and what she calls her daughters. Um, if you haven't seen the documentary Chinda's, you should. Uh, Chinda's um, the first um, openly popular trans woman um, in all of Cap Verde. And Luna, with the face beat to the gods in front, she's a makeup artist. She's also a trans woman. And yeah, that's us um, just hanging out, which is what we do whenever I go home. So, um, and all of them consider themselves Creolish, okay? So, um, my idea of what it means to be a Cape Verdean woman is very expensive, uh, and I'm more, I, I tend to include and not exclude. So, that's as a transnational, uh, black uh, transnational feminist. So what are some of the narratives that we hear, that are out here about us as Cabo Verdean people, no? So we have what I call the outsider's gaze, right? Which is how people see us from outside the community. Yeah, that's the, you know, they're hardworking immigrant people, right? Yeah. You know, they just mind their business and they work hard, they bring home the bacon and they, you know, respectable and they have these um, really, tight-knit families, right? Which we are. Um, and then we have this internal gaze, meaning the way that we look at each other, the way that we look at ourselves, which is often that I hear is we don't support each other enough, right? We don't, we don't show up to events like what Ms. Darlene was talking about, like that's coming up in April, right? Um, why don't more people show up, right? So we have this internalized conversation with ourselves that, um, we don't show up for each other. I hear that quite a lot in the community. Um, but then I'm, you know, if, all you gotta do is turn around and then you say, is that true? <laughs> all you gotta do is, you know, look behind you right now. Folks sitting, you know, Carl, if you look behind you, is that true, right? And then there's this, you know, this is, and then this is when I get into speaking on the, the Criolla um, with the external and internal gaze, meaning outside folk and us are looking at Cape Verdean women with the same objectifying glasses. Meaning Cape Verdean women are just beautiful and sexy and everybody should go to Cape Verde and find themselves a Cape Verdean woman because we're beautiful and sexy. Especially during Carnival. <laughs> Y'all laughing because you know I'm right. Okay, I'll pause there. But this is the reality. I'm gonna let you digest that while I take a sip of water. The reality is that we're all of that, including the mess, right? All of it. Because two things can be true at the same time. It can. Like we don't have to say we're not this, but we're that, right? Are we domestic workers, factory workers, medical assistants, and all that? Yeah, heck yeah, we are. Do we have influencers, business owners, entrepreneurs, engineers, blah, 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 right? But does that all, all of that define us as a people? Does our profession, right, a socioeconomic status, does all that define us as people, right? Does our immigration status define us as people, whether we're documented, undocumented, all of that, right? Um, but where, yes, some of us are documented, some of us are undocumented, and some of us are doc documented, right, with the DACA. Um, and then we think about some of the other issues that we have in our community, like the number of deportees, right, for several reasons why they're being deported, uh, not just for crimes, right? We also know that we have a major issue related to gender-based violence in our community, you know, um, not just in the United States, but mainly in Cap Verde. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but there was the, a young woman um, that was murdered by her partner, and then the partner was found maybe a day later um, in the city of Portnov, uh, found a day later. He uh, died by suicide. 
So, and all of these come from potentially mental health challenges that we're facing, uh, issues that we're not dealing with in our community for several reasons. One of them could be taboos about what we think we should do about mental health, right? Oh, that, you know, casa. we only talk about that at home. We don't, those are issues, you know, dirty laundry are at home, right? But again, that is not unique to the Cape Verdean community. It's not at all. That's why I'm saying uh, we, we're special, but we're not unique, <laughs> right? A lot of the issues are experiencing are, are experienced by uh, many immigrant communities, most immigrant communities, and uh, most black communities, right? So that's why it's like I'm really troubled by the word unique, right? Uh, we need to be uh, mindful of that because. The question that I have is, are we using the word unique to sort of distance ourselves from other immigrant communities and other black communities? Like, why are we using the word unique? Think about that, right? And then this interesting, interesting phenomenon that I found lately, that I'm not found, but I'm uh, jealously looking at lately, is this voluntary homeland return by these young folk. These young folk who are having the audacity to say, there's too much racism in this country, this unemployment rate, Donald Trump, I just got to go. I'm going back home. And before you know it, you see their cute little selves getting on planes and setting, they just thought, we're going back home. Because why? Because we can. Because we're not putting up with this anymore. So there's this interesting thing that is happening, this phenomenon with you know folks in their late 20s, early 30s, the audacity of some people who are not like second and third generation Cape Verdeans, not even born in Cape Verde, they're like, we're going back home when they were born right here. And I say, I feel you. I feel you, my respect, because I don't have the courage. I was going to say something else. I don't have the courage to do that, but more power to you. Uh, because they understand that post pandemic, all you need is this little device right here, and it's portable. And if they have a job that has internet, then they have a portable device, they can work from anywhere. Yeah. Well, look at that. Yeah. I'm here for it. And me and my husband are like, hmm, <laughs> these kids need to hurry up and go to college. <laughs> <laughs> we done bought land, y'all. <laughs> Now let's get to the good stuff. Y'all, when I was in grad school, I Googled Cape Verdean women. I kid you not. And this is what came up. You all read this mess. How to meet Cape Verdean women, Catholic singles. What happens when hundreds of Portuguese men fall in love with African women? The answer, Cape Verde girls. You'll love their caramel skin, curly hair, and green eyes because my glasses fail me, I have to read from here. <laughs> Remember the caramel skin, curly hair, and green eyes? About 69% of the population is mixed and only 27% are African. Wow. <laughs> I won't bore you with the rest of it because you can read for yourself on that screen. But this is what the internet is saying that who we are, okay? Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. That's what you, that, right? It's uh, insulting, it's disturbing. This is what's leading to sex tourism on the islands. And remember when I told you about um, people being encouraged to go to Cap Verde specifically during Carnaval? Uh, okay, okay, mm -hmm. sex tourism. And if I may add, this is not just encouraging folks to go because of the women, but because of men and young boys, okay? So child abuse is at play here, okay? The trafficking of children is at play here. So with all the jokes aside, this is a major issue that we have to be very honest about. So to the degree that now I'm very cautious about telling people, yeah, you should go to Cape Verde. My question is, with what intention? What is your intention? 
because of these conversations, that's why I had the title Critical Conversations, Critical Perspectives on Transnationalism, Gender, and the Creole Community. Because I want us to be more critical and more nuanced about the way that we see ourselves and the way that others see us and others study us beyond surface conversations, right? It's one thing, yes, you know, written the history of Cape Verde, that's all cute, you know, like I get that, it's very important. But now we are at a critical juncture in the development and the continued development of our communities where we need to start having more nuanced conversation about what does it mean to be in support of or in the Cabo Verdean community. And that goes for Cape Verdean folks, that goes for our allies, right, our co-conspirators, that goes for anyone who is coming in contact with our communities, our people, our children, blah, 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 blah. It is time for us to have more critical, more nuanced conversations, right? Because the issues are critical and complex and nuanced, okay? And again, this is not unique to Cap Verde because you see the same things happening in Dominican Republic, in Brazil, in Haiti, insert whatever touristy destination here, okay? So a lot of it is coming from this internalized conversation that we have about ourselves um, has a lot to do with the legacy of Portuguese col colonialism, yes. right? I mean, people will be like, well, why, why is this happening? And my answer is always, because colonialism. <laughs> oh, Teresa, when are you gonna stop saying that? Like, never. <laughs> like, never. Like, my response is, why is this happening? Because white supremacy. <laughs> and in essence, uh, the patriarchy and colonialism. So it all goes, it's a, it's, it just goes back, right? And I say that laughing, but I say it with a serious face. I say it in my classroom, and I will say it until my face turns red, blue, whatever, because that is what it is. The legacy is so far ingrained into who we are, um, into who we think we are, I should say, that it's, it, it, has, it, will, it will have to take some critical conversations. And, it, it, and, and some difficult conversations, uh, difficult actions. Like we have to be courageous in order to undo and dismantle all of this. Like we're gonna have to be courageous about this. Yeah. Like you can like not, not be courageous in calling people out when you see it, when you hear it, right? Let me rephrase that um, because I use calling people in. You don't have to call people out. You can call them in. You can say, come over here. Let me, let me holler at you for a second. Let's, let's talk about this. So I've been using that. You call people in. You don't have to call them out because that means you're shaming them into this conversation. But you call them in, and then you go privately, and you go have that conversation. OK? Um, but as a black woman, oftentimes, I think, is this information on the internet? Is it in a book? Because I'm not in the business of educating everybody. There are some things that people just, particularly white folks, they just need, they, they need to know. Because it, it's common knowledge. It's out there. Go read it. It's not my job to educate you every single time, right? But when it comes to my community, I'm dead serious about it. Like, mortally serious. Like, I don't play when it comes to, uh, to Cape Verdeans. Like, my entire life's work has been about my community. So we need to be dead serious about that, right? Um, but it's hard to be that serious, to be dead serious, when literary movements still today, right? From back in the day, from the Claridad times, right? The folks, Claridad movement that really began talking about the Cape Verdean culture, right? So we're talking about uh, Balthazar Lopes, right? And the newer folks like Germán Almeida who's still hanging out, you know, on the islands. But there's still literary movements that are still referring to Cape Verdean women in these weird terms, these not so flattering terms, right? And so again, both things can be true. They can be our literary giants, like 
the <laughs> ones who do all the work who advance our cultural forward, but they can also be also part of the folks who are adding to the mess. Mm -hmm. Two things can be true. So you don't have to cancel people out. You just got to call them in. <laughs> you feel me? OK. Mm -hmm. And then, <coughs> then you have songs when you're referring to Cape Verdean women, you know, Criola <coughs> Boa, and all of that, right? And you know, I've called them in. You know, I've, I've written a message or two to Danish Grassa and um, uh, some of our faves are problematic, <coughs> like, you know, Nelson Freitas. You know, we love their music, <laughs> but they're still hella problematic. Right? Like Danish Grasa, he done deleted a whole video because the Cape Verdean uh, female canon came after him because his videos consistently only have light skin Creoles in them. Consistently. So when the new video came out, I think this was a couple of years ago, I never saw that video again after we came after him. Because <laughs> folks, you know, one Creola said something, then somebody else tagged me, and then I tagged somebody else, and they just took off from there. Because I'm like, Danish, what message are you sending to your daughters? You have daughters about who is considered beautiful. Like, I love your music, but honey, baby, something's got to change. Right? Like, we're not saying light-skinned Creolas aren't Beautiful. Heck, I'm a light-skinned Criolla. But I, I understand the privilege of what that means, right? But I, I go hard for all Criollas. So again, we call Danish in. Um, I mean, he, he made the choice to not take the video down, and we never saw it again. But that's him. Um, but we've got, we've, got, we've got to be serious. We've got to be serious, dead serious. How do we actually show up in the world? We show up like this and so much more, y'all. Right? This is just a fraction of how we show up. This is the stuff that's not happening, that's not pulling, that's not coming up when you Google us. Right? What's not coming up is Fanny Martins, the, one of the uh, body positivity influencer. She's US based now trained medical doctor, but she's on the Podraza team right now. She's going to be there on Saturday doing a talk. But she's a heck of an influencer talking about all the great things um, Cape Verdean culture, not just about our women. She's over here on self empowerment education section. We're also involved in social justice movements. So when they're saying, this whole, the, 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 the conversation that we don't help each other out, right? Remember, I put that in the beginning. You know, we, we don't support each other, we don't help each other out. Well, explain this headline. And then there was a headline that actually had pictures of the same social justice movement. Do y'all remember when Giovanni Rodrigues was killed in Portugal by, you know, the, the Portuguese folks who stabbed him or hit him to death? He was you know, just a young man in his early 20s and was studying, right, from the island, I think, Fogel. Then he was beaten and left to die. And nobody said anything, but the Cape Verdeans, the very next day, showed up at every single Portuguese and Cape Verdean age, uh, embassy around the world. Make it make sense. How are you saying that we don't support each other when this Brockton headline was sort of uh, multipl uh, multiplied all over the world, in Portugal, in London, in Luxembourg, in Holland. The same headline was everywhere, right? The Cabo Queer page, they're going to have a session at Poderaza on Saturday. It's going to be the first session ever. And I'm, you know, these firsts, I'm, I feel some kind of way about the firsts, like the first black person to do this, and the first Cape Verdean. Um, because it just means that in 2024, we still are talking about firsts. That's problematic for me, right? But in our community, at Poderaz on Saturday, it's going to be the first time there's going to be a panel on the, queer, on the Cape Verdean queer community. And you best believe I'm going to be there front row because I'm not an ally of the community. I'm a co-conspirator. Because Cape Verdeans are queer, and queers are Cape Verdeans and they make up the community. And then, of course, I couldn't help but to highlight Criolos Contra Cancer. I mean, the work that they do, you know, Annie Lobo and Luis Almeida, 
they're doing the good work. So how can we possibly say that Creoles don't, we don't help each other, we don't help each other, that we're not there for each other, when this is just not even scratching the surface, or we don't highlight each other, that we're not doing anything of positive um, when, when, when this is, you know, and this is not just me talking. This is, you know, again, I've been doing this work for over 20 years. I know a little bit of what I'm talking about, right? No offense, elders. But <laughs> I've got plenty more of where this came from, of examples, right? And so I think that, again, I'm going to keep repeating myself like a broken record and saying we need to be more critical and nuanced in the way that we're talking about ourselves and each other and the way we allow people to talk about us and what is going on in our community. Like we need to be dead serious and dead critical about this. And yes, and of course now I'm going to, you know, just, you know, a little dust my own shoulder over here because this is the work that I'm doing. So, you know, I highlighted Fanny and Creoles Contra Cancer and Cabo Queers, right? Um, and Creoles from around the world. But then when Amina and I founded the Amina Fernandes Pilgrim, if y'all don't know who Amina is, mm -hmm. thank you, living in a <laughs> hole by now. Um, <laughs> Amina Fernandes Pilgrim, noted historian, community icon, uh, Google her if you don't know who she is. When Amina and I sat down at a coffee shop in Providence in 2015 to talk about, dang, there's no space for Creolis just to like be ourselves like unapologetically and talk about stuff that's like just like that matters to us, right? Um, we wanted to build a legacy where we tell our own stories so that it takes over the internet and so those stories still exist but that it creates a counter narrative, right? So we're not saying Creolish can't be sexy and that K Verdean women aren't like, you know, like Amber Rose and them. We're not saying that. We're just saying that needs to be a div like there needs to be a diversified canon of what it means to be a Creole. That's all we're saying. Because I want to be sexy and fabulous and all those things, right? All of us do, you know, be pretty and mm -hmm. But also, I, I want to also be recognized for all the other things that I do too, right? So that's when you enter the work that we did on the Poderaza Conference that's been going strong since 2016. And then we created also Poderaza Legacy, which is specifically for middle and high school aged um, Creolish. Right? And that was during the pandemic. And that was critical because we knew that mental health was starting to impact our young people. So we wanted to get them in front of successful Cape Verdean women. And all the Cape Verdean women we called, they answered, like professionals in their fields. They, they came in droves. And the wonderful thing about that was that Criolas answers from all around the world. So the pandemic was this really horrible time for the world. But it also showed that we were able to connect from all the corners. And everybody showed up, from Caver to Brazil. I mean, everybody showed up and was part of it. And then, of course, we decided that we wanted to memorialize all of this legacy in, in a book, the book that um, Amina and I uh, co-edited, where um, amazing Criola authors from the community, like Eva, uh, and so many others are part of. And we wanted it to be about the community. We didn't want it to be like some academic thing where just, you know, it'd be in like the university uh, library. You know, that's cool because then, you know, the libraries and the, the universities pick it up. But we wanted, you know, everybody to be able to say, oh my gosh, like this is pretty cool. Like we have this piece of literature that we get to, um, uh, have that we get to call our own. And then, um, I don't know if y'all know this, but there's a new book coming out. And it's the first book about us, written by us, for us. And it's coming out in May. And I'm gonna show you, you'll be the first audience to see the cover of that book. But I'm gonna show you that in a minute. So this is the cover of the book that Amina and I um, co-edited, the one that I'm talking about that Eva's part of and other members of the community, you know, Candida Rose, um, 
and other literary giants, um, we were so dead serious about it being about the community that I mean, and I put our grandmothers on the cover. We we don't play, y'all. I told you we're not playing. So that's that's my grandmother on the bottom, and that's Amina's grandmother on the top. It's about the community. Um, the charge. Here we are. I want us to think about how do we move the needle forward on being more critical when, as it relates to our research, the community development piece, and in popular imagination. And by that I mean, you know, just out here, like popular culture. Especially in the age of social media, we have to be very intentional about this. Um, but in social media, I think Creoles in general are winning because we're using it for, for good, right? Maybe it's the, I'm, I'm, I'm very positive about things. Some folks are more, uh, uh, they're not as optimistic as I am. I tend to, to curate my social media to work for me so that I see uh, my Creoles doing amazing things. Shout out to Carlos's daughter for being an example out there. I don't know, if, should I say that out loud? No, okay, because <laughs> I'm a fan. I, I'm a huge fan, I'm sorry, I should, yes. So, so she, whoo, she's an icon, okay, I'll be quiet, because um, I might be embarrassing you. Um, but we need those images, we need, we need the images of the Creology that are coming out of Cap Vert, you know, so I'm thinking about, um, you know, songstresses like um, Ellie Parish, who's very, uh, very unapologetic about being liberated, independent young woman, and lets that be known in her music. Uh, Ali da Almeida. So these are some, but also regular, everyday Cape Verdean women. Um, I'm, I'm calling, not begging, I'm, I'm calling and demanding that future research pivot its focus and realizes that, hey, there's a changing trend here. Like, Cape Verdeans are. Like we're complicating the way we're doing life and things. So show that in your research. <laughs> That's basically what I'm saying. Like talk about that in your research. Don't just say, okay, virgins came here to New Bedford, you know, through, through whaling and then went to Cape Cod, Massachusetts, you know, and they worked the cranberry bogs. Like, I, that's cute, I can do all that. Yeah, we can do all that. But it's 2024, let's complicate that conversation a little bit. Right? Let's complicate that conversation. Like what else are we doing? Because all you're doing is having the external gaze. It's like, okay, but how are Cape Verdeans living our lives? Like, right? And let's not be bashful about telling our own stories. As the Jamaicans say, let's not be bashful about bigging up ourselves. Like boast a little bit, it's okay. Like if you're doing some good stuff, talk about it. Again, why don't we talk about it? Because colonialism. <laughs> Colonialism has taught us, and white supremacy has taught us, that we don't, we're not supposed to boast about the great things that we're doing. I call BS on the play. I flag, right? Take a 20. No, boast. Say all the things that you're doing. Why not? Colonialism, no, we're not doing that anymore. We're not doing that. Stop it. If you're doing fabulous things, let the world know. Mm. Um, <laughs> As we sing, as we sing, Kavir. <laughs> and so, and, and again, you could see some of, sort of like where my next research thought is going, because I'm fascinated by this idea of all these, particularly the Creologists that are moving back to Kavir. So you might see like an article or something like come out in, a, in like a year, because I'm really fascinated by that. Um, because I'm like, that's, excuse my French, Madam President, that's pretty badass. <laughs> it's the children, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's, that's, that's really, that's pretty cool. But I, I wanna know the nuances of that. For example, in all seriousness, is Cap Verde ready to receive them? Because I, I, remember, I'm a political scientist. I, I do facts and, and, and data. Um, is, 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 the, is, the, is, uh, the, is the society ready to receive them and in which way? Can they continue to work in the society? Uh, for example, if they're gonna be working off the computer, is the internet stability there for them to work off these computers? Will they continue to work for corporations outside of Cap Verde instead of working for Cape Verdean companies? 
how do they invest, right? How, how do they, and, and what is motivating them to invest at home? Or will they feel compelled to come back to whatever country, like the United States or wherever else they come from? So these are the serious questions that I'm thinking about when, I, when I'm uh, looking at these returnees, like these, uh, these folks that are deciding to go to Cap Verde. Um, I'm also thinking about the stakeholders. So I'm not calling out just other folks. I'm talking about our folks and the way they're doing business. I even put the club promoters in there because okay, very, even the way that Creoles are doing like the social life now is changed. I look at everything. You know, so I think about DJ Shy, Veronica Huzad, who's going to be the DJ at Poderaza. Yes, if you think about a conference and you think it's going to be some academic thing and it's going to be boring on Saturday, think again. We come with a DJ, it's a party, There's, we have a good time. If you've been to the conference, you know. So DJ Shy, she has like this whole, what is it, tribe? Has anybody been to tribe that is here today? You've been to tribe? Uh, I know tribe. But you know tribe, right? And it's like a day thing, right? Yes. Uh, the young people aren't partying at night. I wish somebody had told me that. Huh? Tickets are sold out. Sold out. I, I blinked and it was sold out. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I live nowhere near Boston. But I know about Tribe. Because it's huge. The way that Cape Verdeans are partying is different. So we need to be critical about that. So when I put club promoters over there, I wasn't, I wasn't just doing it for doing it. Literally, there's a market that needs to be nuanced. We can't just say, oh, they go to the club at, you know, from 10 o'clock to 2 p.m. No, they're not doing that. That was my generation. They're, this generation is not losing rest. <laughs> because they're very serious about the way they're making their money. We will not lose rest. We want to party during the day, and we want the outfits to be seen, and we want good lighting for social media. <laughs> and very seriously, I want us to be seriously nuanced and critical the way we're thinking about Creolish, because this thing is, is, is just, the perception of the Cape Verdean women has been very, um, even from our own folks, have been very, um, objectifying, sort of like looking in as if the Criolla doesn't have a soul, doesn't have feelings, doesn't have aspirations, doesn't feel pain, right? But we're more than that, as I say. We're more than our labor, than, oh, we work the cranberry bugs and we work the factories. And no, we, we experience joy. We curated events like Tribe, like DJ Shy. Because we want to um, live our best life, right? Um, and we are more than our physical attributes, OK? We have dreams, we have aspirations, and so on and so forth. Let's be nuanced about that. And I wanted to let a Verdean woman speak for herself, right? I wanted to, again, I'm a Cape Verdean woman, I'm sitting here, but I wanted uh, you to also read, um, I'm not sure so, uh, how many of you know that. Amina and I also wrote this piece on a, uh, and it was published in, a, in this uh, book right here, this collection about African women in digital spaces. We, w we wrote this about the way Cape Verdean women show up in social media and the way they use social media for, for activism purposes, right, for movement purposes. And so, you know, I, we know a thing or two about what we're talking about today. <laughs> so again, what we mean by this nuanced, critical perspective is what this Criolla, namely my sister, <laughs> is saying. I am less interested in, uh, yeah, Laura Bert is my sister, sorry. I'm less interested in communicating a specifically Cabo Verdean identity and more interested in representing a holistic perspective of joy. Right? To show radical joy in all of its glory despite living in a world that was not designed for us, right? She says that she's proud to be Cape Verdean. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's part of who she is, right? That's, that's part of that. Um, but that she's interesting in, in joy, this concept of joy. And I think that um, 
it speaks to this idea of what it means to be more nuanced and critical about the ways that we're looking at ourselves and we're allowing others to look at us beyond our labor and our pain, right? Like, what is it that we're looking for? Um, for example, I stay a college professor and I don't go into administration or anything like that. Like, I'm not a dean. I'm not aspiring to be a, you know, a provost or college president, no shade, because I think that's fabulous. Rock on. But for me, um, I just want to live by my best life. Like, I love rest. I love rest. I like a good nap. So I, I'm, I mean, that it is what it is, right? And so I don't have those aspirations. My aspirations continue to be a scholar, to continue to be in conversation with my community, but I don't have the aspirations of that type of leadership. My leadership happens in the community with the Poderaza Conference. My sister is focused on radical joy, and that's okay, right? And then we have Liz Miranda, who's like a whole state representative. You know? So being nuanced is allowing all those criollas to exist in ways that they want to, right? The ways that um, don't just force them to fit in a particular space, right? And there you are. This is the cover of um, the first book in English that I know of by us, for us. It'll be available in May, and it's a collection. So you're the first public audience to see this. I have not shared it yet. Um, it's a collection, and when I tell you I get emotional, and I'm so proud of this collection, all Cape Verdean art, um, authors, contributors from different generations, um, I'm so proud of this work, because when people try to tell us who we are, you know, like, you know, oh, they don't think they're black. Oh, they are this or they're not that. And when I tell you, you should just tell them, you know, there's this book. <laughs> so it's, if you're not gonna believe me, but there's this book of like 15 chapters and the Cape Verdeans are telling you exactly who they are. When are you gonna start believing them? Okay? So when, you, uh, when this comes out, please make sure you copy it. It's, it, this is my second book, Baby, and it's a labor of love. And um, I hope you see the stamps. This was down to the detail of the stamps for my Cape Verdeans in the house. You see it. Uh, it definitely, it was very, um, and, and that's, the cover was done by a Cape Verdean artist, young Cape Verdean artist that I connected with on social media. So it was very much intentionally done for us and by us. So I you cop it in May. You can even pre-order it, that's what I heard. If you Google it, it, it actually, like some of the authors was like, oh my God, Terza, it can be pre-ordered. I'm like, it's out there in the world already? <laughs> Let's talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the clock. I know uh, we only have 10 more minutes, so uh, I'm going to open it for questions, comments. So uh, thank you so much thank again. You. Another round of applause. Oh. For <laughs> so hands up, who's going to talk first? <laughs> He's such a professor. I can see it. <laughs> Uh, one of my students, you have a question. Oh. <laughs> wow. Okay, wow. Vanessa. Hi, Terza. Hi. Um, I just, and I don't think it's necessarily a question. Question or comment. Uh, but I think that, um, so I'm a, I'm a school adjustment counselor in a middle school in Fall River. And um, I, my family, I am an, a daughter of, of immigrant parents, and my family immigrated here from San Miguel, Azores. Yes. And so just talking about the mental health, you know, obviously that's a big line of work with what I do. And so I just appreciate you <laughs> acknowledging that because it, it's not just in the, in the Cape Verde community, it's also in other um, communities as well. Um, that that stigma against it of you know we don't talk about Absolutely. our problems out loud we don't you know the it doesn't leave the house you know Correct. so 
um, and trying to kind of stray away from that and encourage even my parents to be more open about their feelings and their struggles and their anxieties and moments of depression and moments of you know whatever it is that they're struggling with to be more comfortable with expressing themselves because they never had an opportunity to do that you know absolutely yeah uh, I'm very transparent about that. I'm a huge champion of of, um, of mental of seeking mental health um, support. Um, I'm in therapy. My children are in therapy, uh, and and we use it as a, a preventative measure. Okay, so my children are 10 and 12, but they're in therapy because I want to make sure that they have emotional intelligence and they have emotional maturity, right? And they're able to tell me. You know, you know, when they're upset, I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. Like, mommy, I don't want to talk about it right now. I need time to process. When I'm ready, I will talk to you. <laughs> so listen, I'm raising liberated black children, but I don't get to pick and choose when they're liberated, right? <laughs> so when they say I need some time, even though you know I'm gonna be like the mom, like, no, I don't talk about it right now. No, I need to go, and I need to honor what they're saying. And my husband's also in therapy. We are in therapy, uh, supportive, because we believe in you know the space to to just be able to process things, and and, and it's really worked out for us, and particularly for our children. Um, for me, to be honest with you, um, going through grad school, that was a tough time in my life. Like depression kicked my behind. Okay. There were times when I was just dead, just lying to my husband that I was writing my chapters, when I really wasn't. Why? Because imposter syndrome. I was, basically what that meant was like, I, I don't deserve this, I'm not smart enough to do this, there's no way I can do this, right? Because I'm not smart enough, and this is me, I already have a whole master's degree, I'm married, but I'm thinking that there's no way I can finish this, this PhD, so for like two weeks I just laid on the couch and watched TV, and was not writing, but I was telling my husband that I was. And I'm very honest and open about these things because if we're not able to be vulnerable and have these conversations, um, then like, what are we doing? So if I'm asking for transparency, I have to be transparent mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it's still there. Like my depression and my anxiety, I just manage it. I've learned like therapy has helped me to manage it. To be able to get in front of all of you and talk, that's therapy, mm -hmm. right? Like this doesn't just happen. Yeah. So thank you, absolutely. Thank you. Darling. Yes. I want to thank you for giving us a safe space mm -hmm. to think, talk, and think about everything you just said. And I guess I have a comment because when I hear you speak, I think about myself uh, 40 years ago. Mm. And I think about what was different then and what was diff different from now. Okay. And, and I also think about my grandmother. Mm. When you talk about grandmothers, who came from Sunny Cloud. Mm. Yeah. My mother yeah. was, talk about cranberry box, Ooh. my mother was born in 1913. <laughs> and I think about what is the difference, because there were women during that time there were women in, when I was in my 20s and 30s that talked about intersectionality, mm. that talked about who we are as Creolas, yes. even though we were born, a lot of us were born here in second, third generation. Correct. But having that, that connection to Cap Verde and who we were, I think the difference today is technology. Yes social media, and I look at, at, it can be horrible, but I also think it's a wonderful thing. Because as you said earlier, this connectedness yes. that we can all have with each other. Yes. That I can be in the morning in my bed having a conversation with someone in Sunny Cloud about some friends that are visiting there. Correct. So for me, this, for me it's about this is an empowerment issue. Yeah. And when my grandmother came, she had to write letters. She went back to Cabo Verde three times on a packet ship to visit, because she could do that. 
And I think about that month voyage, mm -hmm. back and forth, yeah. and what it meant for her to see her family, mm -hmm. and how I can just be on the phone this morning. So when you talk about intersectionality and who we are, yes, this is important, and we need to talk about that. And we need to talk <coughs> about, well, particularly our children, the, what can be used for negative and what can be used for positive. Correct. Absolutely. And, and uh, thank you for that. Um, so I also wrote letters back home. So when I came to the U.S., it was still at the time that I, uh, I, I looked at it as like, oh my God, my parents are making me write another letter. I had to write all my cousins. Like, so I was just pumping out letters. You know, and then it's like people have email now. But um, I think when Amina and I wrote that chapter on the way social media, theology have used social media for good in, uh, to empower each other, transnationally speaking, um, being able to make these connections with, you know, three hours between here, Cap Vid, and other diaspora locations, that's exactly what we were talking about. And then we also pull from the history, because let's face it, there's nothing unique about what we were saying. It's just we've updated the conversation, and the women, right, back in the time of your, uh, of your mother, grandmother, they were doing what we didn't have a name for yet. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have a concept for yet. They didn't call it, uh, you know, we've got all these different challenges and we're gonna call it intersectionality. Um, so like, for example, my, when uh, my grandmother comes to the US and she visits, I always take her to my classrooms. Um, mm -hmm. She comes to class and I'm like, so grandma, do you think you're a feminist? And she's like, well, you know, we didn't have that term, like I don't, remember that term, but um, if we did, I think I would be a feminist. And she's like, actually, I think I was a feminist because we didn't say those words out loud, right? And I think um, because they were always used within the white context, like the Western context, we stayed away from them because that meant that, for example, you know, like white feminism doesn't, radical white feminism does not honor the entire family structure, the man's right uh, involvement within that family structure where with, with the African families, it, it's the whole package, right? Um, so white feminism was not necessarily a thing that we wanted, that black women or African women wanted to be attached to. So we weren't using words like feminism because that's not what we do because we love men, right? We want the fathers and the brothers, like how can we leave them behind? And so, I think now we have the inter we have social media, we've got these terms that we can use to call a thing a thing. And again, you can use, social media is there for you to use it for whatever benefit or not that you so choose. I've met so many people and gotten, and honestly gotten so many like uh, jobs just because people we, you know, are in my Twitter community. I'm just gonna you know, be very honest with you because I'm being very careful about what I'm putting out into the world, right? It's like, how do I want the world, how do I want my communities to receive me? Yeah, and the other thing that Poderaza, um, that we're thinking about, because when I say Poderaza, like I really feel like is a person. Um, <laughs> like I talk about the conference, like the movement, like it's a person because, but we're thinking about creating a safe space or like a, a symposium where we're addressing the young people and the use of, of social media. So that's the next, that's that next step beyond like, you know, just uh, having a, a legacy event, but then now honing in on some of the, the specific nuanced conversations that we think young people need to be having, like, you know, the mental health piece and the social media piece on how it can be used for. So, Layla, sorry. Sorry. No, no. I was late. Not I'm oh, you can't talk for late. <laughs> I'm, yeah. just joking. I'm just joking. No, next, so next person, hold on. Layla. Layla. No, Layla. I'm Layla. I'm sorry. It's all right. I just want to thank you for uh, bringing up the fact that as gay virgins, we should, Mada Cabordiano, we should boast about all the things that we've done. And as Cabordianos, we don't. We usually hide our history, we don't talk about it. Um, I was born after independence, and so growing up, I didn't learn about our history. Um, 
not in school. I learned because where I come from and my family, so yeah. I was blessed enough to learn a lot about it. <coughs> but I know in school you don't, so Correct. we should. There is a lot of history. All our national heroes are were still alive, are still alive, and the Verdans don't learn about it. Um, we have an opportunity. So if anyone had an opportunity to speak with Napoleon, Caverdians have an opportunity to speak with their national heroes, and they don't. Okay. If you had an opportunity to speak with Camoinge, Caverdians have an opportunity to speak with their authors, and they don't. So we don't boast enough about our people. So I appreciate you giving us permission mm -hmm. to talk about the great things we've done. Mm -hmm. um, even if we have to talk about us being on the cranberry box, we should, yeah, because right. all those people that work in the box are still alive. Mm -hmm. So we should go and talk to them. Like, I didn't come to America as a kid, I came as a grown up, but I didn't know about the box, but I lived close to a bog, and mm -hmm. with my stepfather, I learned that there was the box. I learned so much about the America and the community and what it is that a lot of people think that I was raised here the way I talk about it because I hear from it. So thank you for allowing us and saying it's okay to not allowing the Portuguese and the people let, let us feel less about being Cavardiano. Nós é Cavardiano. I'm not Criole. Criole is not just the face. And I hated the fact that all that the guy saw, the camera on Khan, whomever watched the soccer game, was our face. He couldn't see that we paid for the ticket, we went all the way <laughs> to the other country, it's not cheap, we had to pay for the hotel, we had to pay to stay there, we cheer for our team, we are a whole country. We are not some non well-known country, we were there, we were cheering, and we are beyond just being pretty. Being pretty is just seasoning it's part of on it. top. That's it's it. just the cherry on top of sprinkles. the cake. It's, like it's just a little sprinkle that yeah, God gave still. us because we don't need to have oil or diamonds. So they just gave us that. They gave so us the what, looks. So um, what our good uh, Prima Leila? Leila. What the Prima Leila is talking about in case, uh, you, for those of you who may not uh, have picked up, you know, the African uh, Cup of Nations, uh, it went viral because the camera person just kept on focusing on the Cape Verdean women on the stands. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, this competition, this tournament, the, the team, our national soccer team, made it as far as, mm -hmm. you know, the furthest that we've ever made. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, the kind of, for some reason, well, we know what the reason was, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that the camera guy was not focused on the, on the play. Like, you know, dude, like, <laughs> put the camera on the field. Mm -hmm. No, he kept on going to the the women on the stands, and that went viral. And so now everybody was like, so um, how, how, much, how much is the plane ticket? Located. Yeah, <laughs> how is located? Where's like, the where's they? <laughs> how, how much is the plane ticket? So that goes with that conversation that I was telling you about. Like, okay, well let's go to come, you know let's go to Cape Verde, and, and it just happened. It was around Carnaval time, so now everybody want to go to. I'm like, no, no, stay wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> like me and my me and the homies are we in Carnaval. We don't need more people to come. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm saying like, do you know where my permission to just be my unapologetic self came from? And I always boast about this. It's having gone to a historically black college and university for, for graduate school. Because yeah. it surely wasn't at Providence College. Shout out to PC, I love my education. Thank you for the scholarship. But it's having gone to the Clark Atlanta University where I was literally uplifted as a black person. That's where that permission to be unapologetically Criolla, like, and literally focus on, 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 the, on, on my community. At first there was this like, oh my God, should I be doing that? Like, are they gonna think like I'm not authentic because, well, she's Cape Verdean, how dare you just focus on Cape Verdean? Mm -hmm. I have a colleague whose whole body of work is being on um, Yates. He's an English professor. Mm -hmm. Y'all know Yates? Mm -hmm. Okay. His entire body of work, all the conferences he goes to have been solely about Yates. So why can't I just be focused on the Cape Verdean community? Mm -hmm. 
the minute I sort of, you know, not sort of, the minute that I just, in grad school, that I gave myself permission to be a ride or die for my community, there was no looking back. And I would just tell the story to whoever was gonna listen. And even if they didn't wanna listen, I'd be like, listen, you gonna listen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We should give ourselves permission at all times to do that. Uh, because we've done some amazing things, not only in this country, but globally. Um, I am a, a vocal cabralista, and I will talk about it. You know, my master's thesis was written on the role of Cape Verdean women using Cabral's theoretical framework of development. I'm, I'm a cabralista through and through, and I'll talk about that. I don't care. 100%. Give permission to one, uh, the, the late, <laughs> Bruno, <laughs> come on in, come on in. And, and I, mean, I, mean, I, I just didn't want to die myself. Um, <laughs> so when I was walking in, I, I definitely like picked up a lot on what you were saying. Um, and, and my point is that like, in order for a lot of our, our cousins that are descendants that are here, that love Kaveri, I would say give it a chance, just like DR. Uh, I went to DR recently and I loved it. I was like, oh my God, this is why everybody comes, right? But at the same time, I was so in love with their culture because it reminded me of home. Mm -hmm. But what she was talking about, the fact that I was so proud to be black, was like radical to them. They're like, uh, where you from? I'm black, I'm from, I'm from Cape Verde, but I live, I live in Massachusetts. What's Cape Verde? They look it up. You're not African? No, I'm African, bro. We had a whole 30, 40 minutes where we're going back and forth. And I, and I asked them a personal question, which was like, hey, there was two sides to the story. One was, you know, invading, pillaging, and taking over, and then there's the other one that was fighting to be liberated. Which side do you think you want to be on right now? If, you know, if, if I had to take a pick, you know, I'd be from the side that's coming up. So just take that into perspective. And, and it was, it was like being at home, you know, like a lot of similarity, but also a lot of like self uh, healing that needs to happen. Like I'm in therapy, and I'm proud of it. I've been doing it for five years. You know, like I got a five-year-old, I mean a ten-year-old. I started when he was five. The conversations that I have with him are based like that. I brought him to Cape Verde. I've, I've had a conversation deeply with him about moving just for one year. Hey, let's see, because I came here, and I know this is the greatest country in the world, but I also came from a place that has greatness in it that I want to share back with him. You see what I mean? Returning. Potentially. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. If you in, guys go, it's yeah, you. In, the, in <laughs> respect of everyone's time, I'm just going to allow one more comment or okay. question. Yeah. No, I yeah. just want to say that I'm a lot older than a lot of people here, and being brought up Cape Verde in here, I just want to say how proud I am now because coming up, it was a real struggle. Mm -hmm. You're Cape Verde, what's that? Mm -hmm. You think you're better than us? Mm -hmm. You know, so it was a struggle, and I had to make sure that I knew our history. So when I said I was Cape Verdean, that I could explain what we were, but we went through this forever. It's just coming out now. I mean, every place we went, well, you think you're better than us, but I'm just proud of what's happening now, Absolutely. and that we're getting the recognition that we deserve. Can I make one final comment here? Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, there's a chapter two in, in, in the new book is, a, I think it's chapter two, sorry. One of the chapters in the book, I, I write about um, this whole notion of uh, the multiplicity of identities that we can be as Cape Verdeans. Like, you, we can be black, African, Cape Verdean, all at the same time, right? And then I talk about the intention. So when you distance yourself from your Africanness, your blackness, like, why are you doing that? So those are the questions that I'm asking. But I leave us with this, too. It wasn't, um, it's indirectly related to this convert to, to my talk. But I, I, I want us to also rethink about the way that we either shun or welcome people in the, into the community based on whether or not they were born in Cap Verde. Yeah. Uh, so those of us who are born in Cap Verde um, and want to like side-eye people who were not born in Cap Verde or second or third generation, I, I'm just going to kindly ask us to cut that out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we're all we all the right? right. Um, we're all trying to do this thing together. <laughs> we're all trying to learn who we are. We all are so proud of who we are. And so, please, part of it being critical and nuanced about who we are is to 
stop that divisive mess about, well, you're not Cape Verdean because you weren't born on the islands. And it's just like, no, they're Cape Verdean because Cape Verde's in here. Like, it's in them, and it's in their ancestry, and all of that. It's like a geographical situation that happened, and they weren't born there. But that should not uh, keep us away from building community. So please, that's, that's part of like the story or the message that I want you to go out and like tell you know the cousins and the primus and the tibus, like let's stop that divisiveness because it's not leading us anywhere, okay? That's that colonial conversation that is not, it, it's not gonna lead us anywhere. Stop this conversation you. could be continued on Saturday's <laughs> conference. Yeah, yeah please, yeah. 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 Oh, that's yeah. A good food. Yeah. Yes, or on Twitter, on Instagram. I, I just want to mention um, just a couple of things. You know, I, I would be remiss if I don't mention, you know, uh, someone here also, a couple of people, but um, Jean Montero, who is part of the Cape Verdean uh, Advisory Committee of the Whaling Museum. Yes. Uh, you know, you're talking about support. Yeah. We have support. <laughs> Look at this room. Yes. Yeah. Look at this room. That's what I'm so, uh, it's, uh, but there is a special uh, uh, guest in, in, in the house, someone that just came from um, the Netherlands, Holland, yesterday, uh, uh, Juliette Vega, who is a, a cultural promoter who lives in the Netherlands. All right. We just came to New Bedford today, and I brought, before the conference, I brought him to uh, the Whaley Museum to, to show him the Cape Verdean, uh, permanent Cape Verdean exhibit there. Uh, if you have not visited the Whaley Museum, please visit also to learn a little bit about our history through that museum. So he just came in uh, yeah. yesterday, Thank and I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. And I'm also very uh, happy to be here today, and to meet a lot of uh, like the Cape people over here. So I'm very happy to be here, and uh, thank you for your uh, presentation, for your speech. Thank you for being here. And, and I hope that you also can come to Holland. I, I can invite you to come to Holland. Yeah. <laughs> you should. Invite me. Yeah. Yeah.